All right, joining us now, staff writer at The Atlantic, Frank Four. His latest piece is entitled, Biden Will Be Guided by His Zionism. And in it, Frank, you write in part, quote, Zionism is one of Biden's primary commitments. It's not a belief that he acquired in the course of his political career, but something he says that he learned from his father at the dinner table in the aftermath of the Holocaust. His father would tell him if Israel didn't exist, we'd have to invent it. Biden's Zionism will shape how his administration frames the moment politically. Despite Israel's recent slide away from democracy and despite the rising criticism of the Jewish state within his own party, Biden remains a true believer who doesn't have any qualms linking its struggle for existence to a global struggle against barbarism. That's part of the reason his aides have discussed rhetorically linking Israel's war to the Ukrainian cause and to the defense of Taiwan. Any president would express, express robust support for Israel in the aftermath of the Hamas attack. But the question is how those feelings of solidarity survive through the slog of war. And so that that is interesting. How serious are those conversations? It seems like an overall global message about uh, the importance of democracy and peace in the world and also could break through some of the politics here at home. Right. There is this hope that because Ukraine aid has been stuck in Congress, right. because House, this small faction of, of Republicans, MAGA Republicans in the House have opposed it, that there's this chance now to link it to uh, aid to Israel and aid to Ukraine and to push it through and break through that deadlock up there. Um, but Biden's links to Israel, as you quote, go back to his childhood. He's been visiting the state of Israel, um, uh, you know, dozens of times over the course of his political career. And he has this relationship with Bibi Netanyahu that goes back to the 80s when Netanyahu first arrived in Washington as a junior aide in the Israeli embassy. And one of the first conversations that they had when Biden arrived in office was, hey, Bibi, can you imagine um, uh, that we'd be sitting in these mutual jobs, um, which is kind of darkly funny because they both probably spent large parts of their careers imagining being in those jobs. But th there is this um, tenderness and depth to the relationship that he has with Netanyahu. And so when he has conversations with him um, over the course of this war, he's able to conduct them almost in, this, in a Socratic sort of style where he's able to pose questions about Israeli uh, strategy um, based on trust that he's banking now and has built up over the course of his career. So it's interesting uh, what I could see happening here, given what you're writing here, and just to sort of push your theory forward. Joe Biden has an opportunity here, not that he's looking for it, um, to move from people seeing him sort of as a transitional president even with what he's done in Ukraine and with NATO and unifying uh, the world in that respect. But linking it to Israel and Taiwan, move from transitional president to unify, unifier of the, the world order, um, if successful, um, which would really present a moral question for Trump Republicans, would it not? Yes. I mean, I think that if you look at foreign policy writ large, the world Biden has presided um, over alliances as they have navigated some of the trickiest moments in recent um, foreign policy, the recent history of foreign policy. So whether it is Ukraine or the applied pressure on China, these are instances where conflict situations could spin really dangerously out of control. And what he's been able to do is to modulate, where he's been able to be extremely aggressive on Ukraine and delivered, um, you know, world war levels of aid to an ally who's fighting a proxy war without that conflict dangerously spinning out into a nuclear conflagration. He's managed to put pressure on China without having that pressure spill out militarily. And again, he's going to be in this instance where he's expressing he's, he's a wartime president. He's expressing um, the most um, heightened levels of solidarity with the Israeli ally. And he's also going to have to try to help manage that crisis. So that also doesn't spin dangerously out of control. It really is the best case for his experience.
So, Franklin, the president has undeniably been very forceful and effective uh, on the world stage, but he has indicated that his efforts are hamstrung somewhat by the turmoil here at home. He's drawn those contrasts often. Uh, we obviously know we don't currently have a House speaker. We heard from him uh, in Arizona just a week or two back at the McCain Institute talking about the threats that still persist to democracy. Uh, so in the White House aides you speak to, how do they frame that dilemma? And what is their frustration level that despite Biden being a global statesman and the Republicans being completely dysfunctional, the polls show him in a dead heat in terms of presidential campaign against Donald Trump next year? Right. Well, um, polling rarely credits foreign policy and elections um, don't often hinge on foreign policy with a few notable exceptions. Um, I think the level of frustration with House Republicans is, uh, is, is extremely large. And I think before um, this Israel, this, the Hamas invasion of, of Israel and the atrocities, I think that there was little strategy or hope for getting the U necessary Ukraine packages through the House. And then there's all this talk now, and it's now bipartisan talk about linking the aid packages together, which is maybe the best hope that they now have for continuing to get Ukraine the arms that Ukraine needs. Franklin, uh, you've written a book, The Last Politician, about this president of the United States who is now fighting a two-front war, one in Ukraine, having pulled NATO together in support of Ukraine versus Russia, and now one in the Middle East, Israel against Iran, Hezbollah, and Hamas uh, against terrorism. Uh, Tom Friedman was on with us earlier today, and he indicated in his words Nobody had to write that speech for him. It was him, unquote, mm. the speech that Joe Biden gave yesterday. So my question to you is, what was your impression of the speech? And did you think there was a level of righteous anger that you had never seen before in that speech delivery? Well, I think uh, that speech was extremely emotional. I agree with Tom Friedman that he was uh, he was channeling um, his own sense of anger and despair that the calls with Bibi Netanyahu began over the course of the weekend. And Netanyahu um, had had ex had narrated in very vivid detail um, days before uh, that last call what had happened at the music festival and in other instances in the south of Israel. And Biden felt the same sort of anger and despair that Netanyahu felt, that the Israel is an issue that he feels spiritually connected to. It's ingrained in his liberalism. He comes from this, this prior generation, this prior moment when Israel was the ultimate underdog um, story. And um, and going back to the Truman administration, uh, Zionism was a liberal cause. I think that generationally, Nancy Pelosi, um, Chuck Schumer are kind of in the same place that, that Biden is, even if younger members of his party aren't. And so when he delivers a message like that, when you can look at his face, mm -hmm. you can listen to the intonations, you know it's sincere. Staff writer at The Atlantic, Frank Forth, thank you very much for coming on this morning, and we appreciate your piece. Thank you.